Well, good evening. It's good to see everybody this evening. Uh, tonight, uh, the subject is pleasing God and not man. You will be, we'll be looking at Galatians chapter 1, beginning at verse 6. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. I also uh, like for you to hold places for some other books that we're going to look at. I'd like for you to hold some places. There's four places primarily I'd like for you to hold. Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, the book of Second Thessalonians, Second Timothy, and Matthew. If you would kind of mark those places so you'll be ready, have your Bibles ready and mark uh, Ephesians, Second Thessalonians, Second Timothy, and Matthew, the book of Matthew. But we'll start off in Galatians chapter 1, beginning at verse number 6. Welcome to our summer series. Uh, if you're visiting with us, we're glad to have you with us. Uh, before we begin this evening, let's have a word of prayer. Our gracious, loving, heavenly Father, thank you, O oh Lord, for this beautiful day. Thank you for each day that we have in our lives. We're thankful for your holy word. Help us to study your word on a daily basis. Help us to uh, apply what we learn to our lives each day. We pray that others will be able to see your son in our life. Dear Lord, we pray for those that couldn't be here. We pray for those that are sick. Pray that you'll give them comfort and strength. And Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the avenue of prayer, that you hear our prayers, and we're most thankful that you answer our prayers. We're so thankful for the spiritual blessings that are found in Jesus. We're thankful for the privilege that we have to be a child of God. And Heavenly Father, be with us this evening. We ask that you forgive us each day where we fail you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, pleasing God and not man. The book of Galatians was written for a, not for a specific congregation, but to all the churches in the Roman province of Galatia. Galatia, that Roman province, is located where we call today Asia Minor. The area got its name from the Gauls. The Romans had a fierce, many fierce battles with the Gauls. And Caesar described the Gauls as being restless and changeable people. The Galatians in Paul's day, when he was there, the people were composed of Gauls, they were composed of Romans, they were composed of Greeks, and they were composed of Jews. And Judaism had a strong influence on all the Gentile congregations in that area. We see in the Galatian churches that there were many problems that the church today faces. The Galatian Christians were fickle. By fickle, I mean they were unstable, they were changeable, they were undependable, they were easily influenced, and they were easily influenced by Judaizing teachers. Paul's letter addresses false teaching. He refutes the notion that Christianity can be mixed with Judaism. Ism. It's not a new patch put on a, or sewn on an old Jewish garment. It's Christianity. And so all through the ages, the book of Galatians has been a stronghold for us, hasn't it? Against false teaching and against ritualism of all kinds. And so if you'll notice, beginning in chapter 1, verse 1, Paul even has to defend his apostleship. He told them that it came directly from Jesus Christ, that the other apostles did not choose him, they did not train him, they did not 
teach him, his message came directly from God. So in verses 6 through 10, I want you to follow along with me. He says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Then he goes on to say in verse 8, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. Again, or as we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. For, I, I, for am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I was still trying to please men, I would not be the bondservant of Christ. So Paul here, he is amazed. He, he, he marvels, he, it says. It's hard for him to believe that these Christians are deserting Jesus Christ and his gospel, the gospel of our salvation, leaving the grace, the free gift of God. We can't earn it. We can't buy it. We can't work for it. We hear it. We believe it. And we obey the gospel of our salvation. So Jesus... He marveled twice. I can think of two times, maybe the only two times, you'll have to check me, that he marveled twice during his ministry. First was in Matthew chapter 8, the centurion's faith, if you remember. The servant was home, and, and he was with Jesus, and he asked the servant to be healed, but the servant was at home. And so he asked Jesus to heal him, but he didn't want Jesus to go to his home. He said, I'm not worthy for you to even enter my home. But just say the word, and my servant will be healed. Just say the word, and he was healed. In Matthew chapter 8 and verse 10, now when Jesus heard this, he marveled. And he said to those who were following, Truly, I say to you, I have not found such a great faith with anyone in Israel, he says. So he also marveled at the unbelief of the people of Nazareth in Mark 6. Jesus, he went to his hometown. They know him. They know his parents. They know his brothers and sisters. But because of their unbelief, he didn't do any miracles there. And in Mark 6, and verse 6 tells us that Jesus marveled or he wondered at their unbelief. So he marveled to, twice, once for, their, for the centurion's belief, his faith, and another for their unbelief, and he marveled over that. So here in Galatians, Paul's amazed. Paul can't, he's astonished. He, he marvels that the churches here, the ones that were taught the gospel of salvation were so quickly deserting him, deserting God, who called you by the grace of Christ, he says, all for a different gospel. Paul says that, that, that it's really no gospel at all, didn't he? It was God's plan from the beginning of time to call us, by the preaching of the gospel. We are to believe it, we are to obey it, we are to live it in our lives each day, to be faithful into death, and I'll give you the crown of life. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 that I had you mark in that book, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14, says, But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, Beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in all the truth. It was for this he called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Christians are sanctified. Sanctified means set apart made holy by the Spirit and by faith and truth of the gospel of Christ. So we see how important it is, the gospel of Christ, that we're sanctified, we're set apart, 
So here, these Galatians were called by God. They were called by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And now, what are they doing? They're separating themselves from God. They're rejecting Jesus. They're rejecting salvation. They're rejecting the pure gospel truth, all for a different gospel. And Paul says in verse 7, it's not really, not another. The pure gospel of Christ saves us. There is not another. There will never be another. And false teachers are, are, are not making a new gospel. What are they doing? They're distorting the gospel of Christ. They're trying to add to it here in, in Galatians. They're trying to, Judaizing Christians are trying to, to add the old law, the old observances of the old law, to obey the law. To be a Christian, they're saying you had to obey also the old law and circumcision to be saved. So they're adding to God's law, adding to God's gospel. There's really no difference today, if you think about it. There are many false religious groups that want to add to or want to take away from God's Word. And, and they prey on the helpless or those that do not know the Scriptures. And they make it sound so pleasing, don't they? They make it sound so inviting. And it's all false. It sounds so pleasing and so hopeful. But they distort it. They distort the true gospel of God. Paul says it's a perverted gospel. They misinterpret. They lead away. They lead astray. They corrupt it. They make it fit their way, or they may fit, make it fit their agenda that they have. It's amazing. Do you think they have a better way than God? They distort they changed the conditions of the gospel, and many are led astray. And they're saying to them, just bow your heads and raise your hand and believe, and, and, and nothing else is required. You can go on about your business. And it'll be okay. I was at a funeral the other day, and that's exact. I wanted to crawl under the pew. The, that's what the man said. It's all required. Just, just go on your way. I want you to think about this for just a moment. I want, to think, I want you to think about what he said and what's being said everywhere in our nation and in the world. I want you to just stop for a moment and consider something. Let's look first at, at John chapter 9. In John chapter 9, we know the man that was born blind. He was blind from birth. He had never seen a tree. He had never seen his mother's face. He had, he had never seen a building, never seen a dog or a cat. He has been blind from birth. And so Jesus saw him. He made the spittle, and he made clay out of it, and he wiped it on his eyes and told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. And the man did exactly what Jesus said. And in an instant, as fast as you can blink your eyes, this man had sight and he could see. What if the man had told the Lord? What if he had told Jesus, Lord, I, I, wait a minute, I, I know a lady next door and she's got a big water pot. I think I'll just go over there to that water pot and wash that clay off for sale. I think that's close. Isn't that good enough, Lord? She got a good, fresh water. and will take care of that. Or what if he said, oh, I think it's better to go over here. There's a, there's a better pool over here. And, or what if he'd say, oh, Lord, wait a minute. There's a pool closer than that pool of Siloam that you want me to go to. How many of us think that he would have received his sight to make up his own way? No, he wouldn't, would he? He would not have received his sight. And then we can go to Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. The first gospel sermon was preached, and people heard the word, and they believed the word. And so these are believers now. These are believers, and they ask the question in verse 37 of Acts chapter 2, what shall we do? They knew there was something else for them to do. 
And they were told what that was in verse 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission or forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so that day, 3,000 people obeyed, and they were automatically added to the Lord's church. Verse 41, he did the adding. I've often wondered how many walked away. How many walked away? How many walked away going, well, I don't know about that. Uh, there's got to be some other way to do this. I, I just don't, I, I just don't want to do that. How many did that? We'll never know. But if it's any indication of, of today's world, there were lots of them. There are many false teachers today that pick their own way. They want to meet their own agenda. They want to add to or they want to take away from his word. They say, that, well, now wait a minute. Now, baptism isn't necessary. You don't need to be buried in water. I don't care what it says. I don't believe that, that the Lord meant to do this. I think he was just giving us an example. And on and on and on and on it goes, doesn't it? It goes on forever. They say to themselves, God didn't mean that. There are many groups today that say that God doesn't really have eternal punishment. There is no eternal punishment. There is no hell. That everything's okay. You just live your life. You just go on and, and everything's just rosy. They completely disregard God's word. They completely disregard Jesus' teaching. Others change the completeness of scripture you see they have another book a book by man and they place it on an equal basis with the Bible that we hold in our hands written by over 40 different authors over 1400 years and it just, it just all fits together the way God intended it to do it's his holy word and we know that the Word of God is complete. We have everything that pertains to life and godliness. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. We don't need anything else. They sound so convincing. And they lead millions away from the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Even members of the church fall for it. And so it is with the things of man. You know, I thought about this not too long ago, and if, if you have a glass of water, pure glass of water, but you have some poison here, and you want to just put just, just a little drop into that pure water, it's not a pure glass of water anymore. It's a glass of poison water. False teachers today tickle the ears of many, and there are many in the church that have ears that like to be tickled. And Jesus faced those. He faced people that just wanted to give him lip service because they were following the traditions of men. Look at Matthew chapter 15, verse 8 and 9. I had you hold your place in chapter Matthew, Matthew, so go to chapter 15, verse 8 and 9. He said, this, this people honors me with their lips. They give lip service. But their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts or the commandments of men. Matthew chapter 7. Turn back to Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. Jesus said, enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide, and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and many there be that go in, who enter through it. For the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few that find it. We all know these verses. The pure gospel of Christ is based on the death, the burial, and a resurrection of Jesus Christ. God sent his son to this earth, 
born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He gave himself on the cross for our sins. The perfect one-time sacrifice is a lamb without blemish and without spot. Buried in a barred tomb, raised by the power of God, he conquered death so that we can be saved, so that we will have reserved for us a home in heaven if we'll live faithful to him. The church of Jesus Christ is not a denomination. Jesus Christ is the head. I want you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. He said, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints? And what a surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. He put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him the head, or gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. We are his church. We are the church. All of us come together. All of us are members. Where everyone has a part to play. His church was purchased with his blood. There's not an earthly headquarters. It's not in England. It's not in Rome. And it's not in Salt Lake City. The Bible is the sole authority. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. There are no creeds. There are no manuals of man. What made Christians 2,000 years ago makes Christians today. God's plan of salvation is specified in his word. We're to hear the word of God. Romans 10 of verse 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing how? By the word of God. We believe in Jesus Christ, John chapter 8 and verse 24. We repent of our sins, Luke 13, verse 3 and Acts 2, 38. We confess Christ as the Son of God, Matthew 10, verse 32. We're baptized for the remission of our sins, Acts 2 and verse 38. And there are many more references that I won't have time to give you from each one that you know as well as I do. God's plan for scriptural worship is specified in his word. Teaching, Matthew 28 and verse 20. Singing, Ephesians 5 and verse 19. And that does not include, it is not authorized, 76 trombones. The Lord's Supper in Acts 20 and verse 7. The giving of our means, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2. And other scriptural references. Paul said in Galatians that we've been studying in verses 8 through 9 that we're studying right now, though he or an angel from heaven preach anything contrary to this, he is accursed. And then to make sure that we understand exactly what he said, he repeats it again. He is accursed. For emphasis, he repeats it. God will not tolerate it. He will not accept it, and neither can we. Ever. In Paul's day, Judaizing teachers were trying to add to the Word of God. They had additional requirements. You need to be circumcised. We need to add the old law. Even the Jews had taken the old law. Beverly and I were talking about this. I don't know, yesterday or today, sometime. Even the Jews had taken their old law and had added to it and added to it and added to it, and now they're trying to add to the gospel. 
They're trying to add to the gospel the burdens of man. Now listen, no one today in the religious world, no one today would dare admit that they're perverting the gospel of the Lord. They would never admit that. But the truth is, when we take away or when we add to, that's exactly what's happening. The world has made a watered-down, perverted gospel that's no gospel at all. And these teachers are leading countless millions down this wide, through this wide gate, down this broad way. It's a total disrespect for God's holy word. And millions are going down a wrong road. Listen, it's even in the church. And we have to be on alert. We have to be ready, prepared, knowledgeable of God's word. It comes down to us. We have to examine ourselves. Look at Galatians 1 verse 10 where we study. For am I now, he said, seeking the favor of men or of God? Am I striving to please God? So there's this two questions that Paul is asking us, that God is asking us. Are we striving to please God? Are we seeking the favor of men? Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. But man always thinks he has a better plan, doesn't he? Man has his shortcuts. He has his deletions. He has the things he adds to God's Word. It's gone on forever and will always go on. And there are members of the church that, that fall for it. It's as though we're ashamed of the pure gospel the gospel of Christ, the power to save. Romans 1 and verse 16, what's Paul say? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. We can be religious and not please God. Paul did. He understands. He was the pride of his countrymen. Everybody looked up to him. He was making man proud of him. He thought he was pleasing to God, but he was wrong. And it can happen to him. It can happen to us if we're not careful. Galatians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, Paul tells about this. Look over in 13 and 14. Paul says, For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and I tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries, among my countrymen being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. But something changed, didn't it? Paul met Jesus Christ on his way to Damascus to persecute Christians there, and he made him on a dusty road. And Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? And he was led by the hand. You're going to be told what to do when you get to the city. And so he was led by the hand because he's blind. The Lord blinded him. And so he got there, and Ananias went in to tell him what to do. And Ananias told him he was going to be the spokesman. He was going to carry the word of the gospel to the whole world. And he told him, what are you waiting for? In Acts 22 and verse 16, what are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized and do what? Wash away your sins. So we have to ask ourselves the question, am I doing things or accepting things in the name of religion that's not right with God? We have to ask ourselves, are, are, are we 
knowledgeable enough in the Scriptures? Do we want to please God to do always what's only authorized by God? Boy, some of us have been fooled by the world that says it doesn't matter what you do as long as you're sincere. Following some man with a million-dollar smile and a bank account to prove it. <laughs> Those of us in, church, in the church, we have ample warning that we must not ever fall for it or we'll be led astray. We'll be led astray from serving God faithfully all our lives in Revelations 2 and verse 10, that everything's okay as long as we're sincere. 2 Timothy chapter 4, that one of the places I had you mark, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. This is for us. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away from their ears from the truth and be turned into myths, turn aside to myths. There are many of us today in the church that sadly have no knowledge of the Scriptures. We have no idea if things are right or not. We have no idea if it's in accordance to God's will or not. Hosea 4 and verse 6 tells us, My people are destroyed for their lack of knowledge, and it pertained to them, the children of Israel at that time, and it pertains to us today. There are some in the Lord's body even that, that claim publicly that the Lord's church is nothing more than one of many, don, many denominations that are worshiping God. We hear it every day. And there are many, many Christians that are falling for it. People like that are abandoning the truth that's clearly defined in Scripture, but they're rejecting it. Remember that Paul says if an angel from heaven tries to teach any other gospel, it's no gospel at all. They are accursed, and we must never accept it. We must be knowledgeable of Scripture. We must study. Too many of us do not study. We had all kinds of excuses why we're not. Too many of us as Christians treat the gospel with about as much respect as we do a fairy tale. We'll fall for anything. We're like a leaf in the wind. We'll blow this way or that way. We have to be ready. We have to be alert. We have to be on guard. Listen just a minute. When our life is no different from the world, when we're so caught up in the physical things of life, when there's not a dime's worth of difference between our life and those in the world, who are we serving? God or man? Look out. Who do we think we're kidding? We're sure not kidding God. when work is planned for the church? Do we shrink back? Do we begin to make excuse why we won't be able to do anything to participate or help? When the elders or others try to encourage us to be faithful in our attendance, do we get mad? Do we go storming off and saying to ourselves, man, he can't tell me what to do. Look at him. When we develop that kind of an attitude, we better look out. 
We say, boy, he can't tell us what to do, but God tells us what to do about that very thing. Don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some. You know, I often wondered about that. And it often scares me. Am I that some? Am I the one that has the habit of the some? We can't be that sum. As Christians, we have to diligently seek Him. We seek to please God in everything that we do. Sometimes we pick up the attitude of the world. We want to go to heaven, but we don't want to please God to get there. He's not fooled. We must do his will in our lives. We must be the proper example of faithfulness. We must be a servant of God. I always like to go back before I finish to Acts chapter 8. In Acts chapter 8, this is what This is what hit me right square in the face one day when I was young. In Acts chapter 8, beginning at verse 26, the Ethiopian is going to be taught by Philip. And if you'll notice as we go through here, it's everything that God commands in his scripture, in his holy word, in his his gospel plan of salvation that man can be saved and have an eternal life in heaven. In verse 26, But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. It's a desert road or it's an it's a unsettled, unpopulated area. There are lots of pools of water everywhere. And so verse 27, So he got up and went. And there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. So what do we know right there? He's a religious man. He has come all the way from Ethiopia to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning in his chariot or sitting in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. He was reading Isaiah 53 about the suffering of Jesus and his death on the cross. In verse 29, then the Spirit said to Philip, go up and join the chariot. So Philip ran up, and he heard him reading Isaiah, the prophet, and he said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, well, how could I? unless someone guides me. And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The passage of Scripture that he was reading in Isaiah 53 says, He was led as a sheep to slaughter, as a lamb, lamb before its shears is silent. He did not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation for his life is removed from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip, and he said, Please tell me, of, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or someone else? And then he gave Philip the opportunity to preach the gospel to him. Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. He preached his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And he preached the gospel on how to be saved. And as the, verse 36, as they went along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he said, he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water and baptized him as well as the eunuch. 
Philip as well as the eunuch went down into water, and he baptized him. And then when he came up out of the water, the Spirit snatched Philip away, and the eunuch went on his way rejoicing, we're told. He obeyed the pure gospel of the Lord. This is what we must always stand for. It's good to see y'all this evening. Be on the